Hi, I'm Charlie Delto, and this is my podcast. I'm something of an armchair philosopher, and I'm of the opinion that a lot of the world's problems right now are philosophical. Join me as we take a politically neutral look at some of the issues that plague our culture today. So grab a chair and turn your grade matter up to 10 as we discuss what everyone else is avoiding. Welcome back to my podcast series on white male privilege. I'm Charlie Delto, and I'm taking a look into whether or not white male privilege really exists, keeping as close as I can to a rational philosophical investigation without getting emotive about it, without throwing uh, my hat in the political ring and really just trying to find out what it is and whether or not we can truly say it exists. In the first podcast, after an introduction, I posited quite importantly, I thought that this is not an observation of nature, but rather an observation of human behavior or of human structures. And I pointed out that the people that we are observing in an attempt to find out whether or not white male privilege exists are themselves by now aware that what they say and do will either prove or disprove white male privilege. And if one assumes that, for example, females have an advantage in saying that men are toxic or that men have privilege, that might influence the statements made by said women about whether or not male privilege really exists. Can we still get an honest answer when we approach this anecdotally? That is to ask people, once we understand that those people that we're asking are aware that their answers have costs and benefits for both themselves and people that we're talking about. So I want to pick up the conversation from there. I want to ask the straight question, does white male privilege exist? And I want to posit here that we're not going to approach a, an anecdotal way of doing it. We're not just going to ask people whether they think they do or not. So we're, we're ignoring, in our second podcast, we took a look at Peggy McIntosh saying, and again, it was just a, a big list of assertions of her saying things that she thinks that she has seen. Let's, let's do better than that and try and come up with an idea on how we might find out that privilege exists. Now, immediately, privilege must exist. Like, it, traces of it must exist. Here we go. Here's, here's some biological privilege. Ready? White people get more vitamin D in an hour of sunlight than black people. Fact, done, finished. But black people get less sunburn than white people do in an hour of sunlight. There you go. There's some privilege for you. It's biological. It's not human structures or cultural traditions or anything. So let's let's try and do that. Um, white people are the target of racism less than black people in America, at least in, in like a, in a Western con context. I don't think anyone would, would doubt that historically anyway. It's probably still true today. But back the other way, black people are more often the beneficiaries of some affirmative action legislation or regulations. Bingo, there you go. There's privilege both ways, one one way, one the other way. And we could do it for male and female quite easily as well. That proves that some privilege exists somewhere. But what it seems that's going on in the in the world at the moment with the social justice warriors, with the celebrities, with the, the large-scale um, activism is that we're not talking about traces of privilege here and there. We're talking about a large absolutist state of affairs where white male privilege is the norm and it's everywhere all at once and it's overpowering. Proving that is going to be very hard, but let's try and design a test that we would do. The first thing we would need is we would work out the quantum of privilege that men have, but also that women have and compare them, that black people have, but also that white people have, that Christians have, but also that Muslims have, that gay people have, that also that straight people have, and have some way of comparing them. So the first step would be an exhaustive list of all the races, all the genders, all the religions. Now that's tough because a European people, one race, are we saying that Romanian people are the same as Irish people? Are we saying Russian people are the same as Georgian people? Are we saying within Germany, is, is Germany a race? Are Bavarian people a race? Are people from northern Bavaria a race? I don't know where all that starts and finishes, but okay, so we need an exhaustive list of all the races. Are Egyptian people and Moroccan people African? They're on the continent of Africa, so they must be, but are we putting them in the same sort of category that we're looking at here as, say, sub-Saharan African people? Are all Asian people the same? Are Japanese people and Indonesian people the same? Tough. Someone has to do that. Glad it's not my job. Then we need to look at the genders, simpler, but not as simple as it used to be. And then religions and what do you do about atheist people and a Baptist church, the same as the Anglican church and blah, blah, blah. So we need an exhaustive list of all the various classifications that we're going to be measuring. 
Second thing, we need an exhaustive list of all the possible situations in which a benefit might befall. One of these categories, sure, band-aids is one, shampoo is another, getting a haircut's another one. But what about getting out of bed in the morning, putting your shoes on, walking out the door, grabbing your keys, getting in the car, driving on the freeway, parking in a parking lot, going up the elevator, walking into a building, greeting the receptionist. Everything you do, there needs to be an exhaustive list in all possible situations. And that's important and it might seem that I'm being pedantic there. But if this list of disparities between, say, men and women, if there are 10 billion possible situations and men have advantages in 50 of them, well, 50 is not a very big number compared to 10 billion. It doesn't explain why men go into engineering and women go into nursing. But if instead there's only, say, a thousand possible situations and men have advantages in 200 of the situations, well, yeah, that's 20%. That may well explain a lot. So we do need a more exhaustive list and a bigger study done. The third thing I would think we need to do is give some sort of weighting to each situation. So if, for example, if you put a Band-Aid on white skin and it looked more flesh colored than if you put it on black skin, sure, that might be an instance of privilege, but really, I mean... How big an issue was that really? How many, how many lives are destroyed because of that? That doesn't seem to carry much weighting. It's kind of like, it's, a, it's, it's highly trivial. However, if, and I've seen this myself, if university professors ask all the white people in the classroom to not speak for the whole class so that non-white people can speak, or if as there is some colleges in America, the, the college or the university has a whole day in which white people are instructed not to come to college campus and security guards prevent them from entering, even if they have to submit an assignment or sit an exam or something like that, then that seems to have a very strong weighting. And you can't just say, well, that's just one thing. Well, it might just be one thing, but it's a pretty huge thing. It's it's certainly more weighty than having a Band-Aid that doesn't match your skin color. The fourth thing I would think we would, I would want to know whether or not there was any intention behind it or not. If the reason that Band-Aids didn't match skin colors was just arbitrary, you know, someone picked a, a flesh color and the factory was in Germany, so they picked German skin color. Ah, I mean, that doesn't seem to be much intention behind that. But if the people that make Band-Aids were deliberately ignoring a certain skin color because they were racist, well, then that seems to be a a much greater consideration for this experiment they're trying to design. Finally, we would need to conduct exhaustive testing of all the outcomes from all the benefits received by the categories in all the situations and then factor in the weighting that I suggested and whether there was intent or no intent. Now, that's a huge test. I want to be cynical, but I'd posit to you it's never going to happen. Right now, all we've got is one group maybe an interested group, given that Peggy McIntosh was a famous feminist, making a hit list against what might be considered her enemy if she's anti-patriarchal or if she's Marxist. I don't know if she is. I shouldn't cast aspersions. Seriously, if Peggy McIntosh had any balls at all as an academic, though, she would have made a list back the other way, or she would have compared males and females. That might have been a little less triggering and made two lists. At least it would have been a start and it's somewhere where we could have gone from. Right now, as I understand it, all we do is hang shit on white people and then white people like dodge the conversation. That's not getting us anywhere. So at this point in time, it's not that I'm saying that white male privilege, this absolute state of affairs doesn't exist. It's just I don't think, I can't, I don't know of anyone that's really undertaken to try and prove it. So there might be a rather more organic test to see whether or not white male privilege exists. We might let it happen like from the people, so to speak, like the way that Wikipedia works or like the way that... Um, social media works. Everyone downloads an app and every time they see an instance of privilege, they upload it and in the app logs, blah, 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 blah. And you nominate a color and a race and a religion, da, 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 da. And as they arise, the app tabulates the results. You know what I'm talking about. It's a very modern thing. However, I'd posit to you that it's unlikely that this will work either. There will be petitioning and dogpiling as like the far right or the feminist community or the red pill community or the Black Lives Matter community get around the issue and try and win the race, so to speak. You know, like with change.org and then like you try and get a petition happening and then like Emma Watson or whoever, Joe Rogan? Anyway, someone decides that they're going to retweet this thing and bang, that's it. All you need is like one big famous celebrity to retweet that change.org stuff and it just takes off. I've seen men's rights activists make huge lists of things that are harder for men and they, they seem legit to me. But that's never, ever made any sort of change to the prevailing narrative. That Red Pill documentary got annihilated. Like I had no chance of getting off the ground. 
So I, I don't think that this is going to work. It's going to completely ignore the generations that don't use technology or the, the races or that don't, and perhaps the religions, Amish people or Mennonites or something that don't use the technology. The third way that we might prove, and I think this is probably what's, what's really happening in the world, that white male privilege exists, is that we could do it rationally. We could say, well, rationally, within America, let's face it, there's not much racism against white people. And let's face it, there is racism against black people and Native Americans. And I don't know what you want to do about Asians and Jews and Mexicans and things. I'm not American, so I don't know that well enough. But rationally, there must be white privilege because white people don't suffer from racism as much as black people do. Now, that would seem a slam dunk. I don't know anyone that would deny that. But I would posit that we would never really work out whether or not black people experienced as much racism as Native Americans. And also, I don't know how we would ever work out when we've corrected things, assuming it does look as though America is trying to correct things, that, the, the, that, that historically there was racism against black America doesn't necessarily, like once it stops and once we correct it, it seems hard to work out if we've gone far enough or when we've gone too far. But this does seem to be the best test of whether or not some amount of white privilege exists, but all we, white male privilege, but all we could ever really say is historically there was white male privilege, but we'd never really know where it went too far. With the gender issue, there's a whole thing as to whether what happened in the pre-enlightenment era was sexism at all. But, I mean, it's been a 100 years since arguably we could say there was a huge amount of equality. There's at least been at least been 50 to 60 years in which we could say equality has existed. We'll never work out whether we've gone too far. At this point in time, I think it's possible to say that we found instances of white male privilege in Peggy McIntosh's article, which we reviewed in the, the second podcast, and there with that last way of looking at things. Yeah, rationally, there must have been some. That is to say, white people escaped racism much more than any other races, but with the caveats that I just mentioned. However, there is a complication here that I want to bring up. Let's look at someone like Prince Harry or Prince William or uh, Donald Trump Jr. or poor old Baron Trump or Paris Hilton, one of these people. I mean, these guys have got privilege up the IR. These guys, are Scott, they will inherit more money than I'll ever, than you and I, than everyone listening to this podcast will ever see these guys will inherit. And we think, wow, they're so lucky. But you know, there's a flip side to that. I wouldn't trade places with Prince Harry or with Baron Trump or with Paris Hilton. I don't know that their lives are all that easy. The flip side to privilege seems to be something like the burden of responsibility. Personally, I do feel that privilege, and we might say what privilege is, is an ease of, of coming to power or a certain sort of innate authority that comes with your skin color. I'm open to the idea that it comes with an equal and opposite measurement uh, allowance of responsibility to take control of your community given who your father was or something like that. I've thought about it and I don't want to go on with that explanation too far because I know it's just a disaster, but that still does feature for me in this conversation about privilege. But to drive home the point about proving does white male privilege exist, I would love to conduct the big experiment that I suggested in the first instance of how we're going to prove it out. You know, pick all the, all the, all the races, all the genders, all the religions, all the whatevers, and then all the instances and give it a weighting and all that sort of stuff. And in my head, I do it. The four that I think are just absolute no brainers to prove that white privilege exists is a, the fact that cops seem to shoot first and ask questions later in America. I mean, that's, that's a slam dunk. Two, that courts are more likely to convict and give longer sentences to people that have black skin rather than white skin. I mean, that just seems a home run. No one would argue that, assuming that that fact is true. Three, that black people don't live as long as white people. I mean, that's about as big as it gets. What's the meaning of life? If nothing else, live as long as you can. And your race seems to determine your life expectancy. And four, like getting followed around a shop, I know that's not as big as the other three, but like that sucks. However, if those four instances of, of pretty weighty, three of those are really, really weighty, prove that there is white privilege. Let's do the gender one now. Between males and females, who are cops more likely to shoot first and ask questions later with, men or women? Clearly men, right? That would be female privilege. Number two, the courts are more likely to convict and give longer sentences to men or women. Men, 
Men get convicted and get get longer sentences all the time. That's a that's a fact in society. Three, who lives longer? Well, women do. Women live longer. And four, who's more likely to get accosted by a security guard? Men. We all know it. How do we have these four things when it plays out racially, giving white privilege, but when it comes to gender, what we just forget these things? Let me let me reverse engineer in this. I think this first situation might be almost impossible to prove that white male privilege exists. But I think that you could pretty quickly debunk the whole privileged community, the whole social just community, by finding an exhaustive list of all of the situations in which there is white privilege over black privilege, and then take those exact same situations and apply them to genders. Women get more welfare, pay less tax, uh, live longer, I'm less likely to get convicted for crimes, you know all the ones. I'd love to do that. I think that's something that can be done. And it, 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 I can see myself in a few weeks' time doing this for a YouTube video or for a podcast or something. Just choose the big 20 or 30 indicators of, of uh, racial privilege, but then flip the script and do it for gender and see if it works out whether or not men are more privileged than women are, which is the, the statement that feminism already makes. So continue on with the question of whether or not white male privilege exists. There's something else that has always occurred to me that well, two other things at least that have always occurred to me that makes me think that it's unlikely. The first one is the whole hashtag believe all women thing. Firstly, that was just ridiculous. Why on earth would you just believe someone because they came forward and and made a, an accusation against a billionaire just as he was about to run for president at the exact moment? I mean, if, if that's not an interest, I don't know what is. If feminism was so much smarter and enlightened than us all with this notion of privilege, why would they invent the hashtag believe all women thing? Clearly that is bestowing the privilege of being believed when you're making a serious accusation against someone based on nothing else but gender. Wouldn't they know not to make that mistake? If they truly believe that privilege was a real thing, why blunder into the obvious mistake of hashtag believe all women and commit the exact same wrongness or crime as the men that you've always disliked. That one's always stuck out at me. The second one is there seems to be a real inconsistency in the triage of all of this, that when it comes to, say, income levels, and I know that's, anyway, I'm going to go with this, with income levels, it doesn't just go white, black, finished, white people make more money than black people, therefore white privilege, end of story. It goes like Jewish, Asian, white, and then someone, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then. I mean, why are we comparing the third and fourth one? I mean, don't care about the first and second. And what about the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth? And with life expectancy, I know it goes Jewish, Asian, Latino, South Asian, which is like Indian, and then white, and then black, and then Native American, I believe. And what, we're only, con we're only interested in the fourth and fifth one there or the fifth and sixth one there? What we, what, we don't care about the number seven one? We don't care about one, two, three, four? Like if we were really doing this privileged thing carefully, we would be a little more, we'd, we'd pay attention to the detail on this a little bit more. It really does feel like Don King or some fight promoter is just goading a fight between black and white on this sort of thing. What about the other ca categories? It's not just black and white out there. The next thing that makes me doubt it is if I ask myself, you know, if you had to be born into this world and you had to be something and that was really going to stick you behind the eight ball, that was going to be really hard for you to get past, it wouldn't be female. And I don't think it would be black. I think it would be disabled. No matter any way you look at it, there are no advantages to being disabled at all. Disabled just seems to be like the, the classification of people who have the very least privilege. Man, you never hear of social justice activists saying that we need more help for disabled people. White feminists just sprint to the front of the line and scream that there's nothing worse than being female. Black Lives Matter people scream that rush to the front of the line and say there's nothing worse than being black. Uh, Australian Aborigines in, in my part of the world say the same thing. Isn't the point of all this that we're supposed to like a, like a Rawlsian thing, like a theory of justice, stand in the original position and think carefully as to who has the least privilege? In my opinion, man, it's got to be disabled people. I don't hear anyone speaking for them. Like it's the exact same thing. In real life, disabled people have it tough. So then you enter the social justice community and think white privilege will, will get me somewhere. Same thing, exact same thing. Everyone forgets disabled people. Happens all the time. You hardly ever hear about them. If we were really doing this privileged thing carefully and rationally, 
Wouldn't we be putting dis- uh, disabled people at the front of the line? I don't see it. If I'm wrong, let me know, but I'm not seeing it. Another issue I have with it is why do we choose race and gender? As I understand it, if you choose other factors like married versus unmarried, educated versus uneducated, the product of a single parent versus the product of a dual parent relationship, like where you saw both parents all the time, the correlations between outcomes become very clear very quickly. Why do we choose race and gender? I've always been a bit, why? Why? Let me think about this. Why do we say women have it worse than men when we could say something like people who have gravi- haven't graduated high school do worse than people who have graduated high school? I'm sure you'd get a stronger correlation with that one. The final thing that makes me doubt that the whole white male privilege thing is real is if white male white uh, males really do control the world and thus create the structures and create the traditions and create the cultures and those structures, cultures and traditions that we've created bestow us a certain privilege. Well, we haven't done a very bloody good job of it, have we? I mean, men die much sooner than women. We didn't get that one right. We make less, whites make less money than Asians. Men get sentenced more often than women. We, we, men get conscripted and go to war and get blown to pieces. Women got brought inside the the castle walls and men got stuck outside it with like spears and swords and things and got all destroyed. Women got off the Titanic first. If we controlled the world and created this structure, which made us more important or gave us this advantage, how did we end up in this position where we die sooner? We don't seem to have done a very good job of it. So there I'm going to leave it for this podcast on really does white male privilege exist? I've gone through a number of scenarios. I'm positing right now we don't know anything other than the anecdotal stories that it does. And I've posited already that the the anecdotal stories are riddled in self-interest. I've devised three ways in which we might do it, the sort of the organic with some app or something like that, but I don't think it'll work because of dogpiling and uh, activism, so to speak. The idea of doing a very, very careful study, again, it's a huge thing. By all means, someone undertake it if you want, but I do think that you could do it that way to show all the things that prove that there's a privilege to being white, but I think that those things would debunk the idea that there was a privilege to being male. I've posited that we can pretty much guarantee rationally that white people haven't in America haven't been subjected to racism as much as black people have. Therefore, rationally, there must have been some white privilege to start with, but we're never really going to know via that method where we've corrected things or perhaps if we've overcorrected things. And then I've posited that the believe all women thing the inconsistency that we always seem to worry about the fourth and fifth ranked race and not the first, second and third, that we don't see that we seem to focus on race and gender rather than marital status or education status. And that the idea that, you know what, white males haven't done a very good job of positioning ourselves for an easier life. Those things really make me sort of doubt it. Oh, and the idea that we really always forget about disabled people who seem to have the least amount of privilege. I'm gonna leave it there. Thanks so much for listening. Please listen to the next next podcast. The next podcast I'm going to go into, all right, let's assume that white male privilege exists. What are the risks in accepting it? I look forward to your company then. And once again, Charlie Delto signing out. Thanks for listening.